introduced also to about 10 years research and publications on uh, that fascinating topic on church architecture in China, from Gothic to Gresnik and other topics that you put in that perspective in your previous lecture. So now we will spend one hour together on the most important work of Edelbert Gresnicht, the Fouren Tache in Beijing. And uh, as my title uh, says, this is a building a Sino Catholic citadel in the heart of Beijing. Architectural enculturation and modernity. On 13 November 1929, Celso Costantini laid the first stone, the cornerstone of the new building of the Catholic University of Peking. And in his speech, he expressed the will of modernization by science and cynicization by culture, both from the perspective of universal Christian solidarity and respect for tradition. This is a very important quote. In this new building, there will be laboratories for the teaching of modern science and for research that leads to new discoveries and expands the horizon of human knowledge. But the university's reverence for the ancient art and culture in China is revealed in the very architectonic lines of this rising structure. Nevertheless, it is far from being a mere dead copy. Rather, it is an example of the renaissance of that style adapted to the needs of modern life. So it's really the idea of a reconciliation and also a rejuvenation thanks to Christianity. My paper is built around four topics, each including a certain number of questions. First, we will see the Christian universities and higher education in China by focusing on two questions. Why was a Catholic university needed in Beijing? And why, what would make that university different from all the other universities in China at that time? Thereafter, we will focus on the Benedictines. Why did the Holy See entrusted the project of the University of Beijing to American Benedictines? And why did these American Benedictines abandon the project eight years after a promising start? Why was this a big failure? Thirdly, we will shift to architecture after having seen the context of universities and monastic Benedictines. The third point is thus focusing on architecture and on the work of Father Gresnicht how did he design a modern Chinese looking university building? And we know he was not an architect. And what makes that Catholic university clearly different from Protestant universities, both in Beijing and in other cities of China? The fourth point is to look to another aspect of architecture, which is not only a question of styles, but it's also a question of construction. Constructing a rational mo modern building with a Chinese roof. What were the architectural requirements of a rational university building? And why was blending architectural tradition and modernity a technical challenge? These are the four aspects I would like to develop with you during that hour and to conclude on the topic of a sino catholic citadel, it's an important word, in the heart of Beijing because the location of this building is also very important and I will end this lecture by raising the question Chinese renaissance or a modern chinoiserie.
Christian universities in China. I will go very fast through this part because there are many publications, historical publications, but also architectural historical publications on this generation of uh, university architecture designed and built in China during the Ming Guo time. So this is a fascinating Gothic church with some uh, elements of Chinese roof that was on the Memorial Chapel of the Chalu University in Xinan. Uh, this building is no more existing now, but with references clearly to English Gothic and uh, very central location in the campus. So the landscape of universities in China during the first half of the 20th century was very complex. There were universities that were founded by the Chinese state, the late Qing Empire and later the Republic. There were also Chinese universities founded by private people, like for example, the university in Xiamen, Amoy University. There were also universities that were not religious, but founded by foreign countries. And then there were Christian universities, understand Protestant universities, that were the result of merging colleges, often from different Protestant denominations, that joined forces to collect funds, build campus, and staff these universities with uh, Western scholars. Often, these colleges also aimed at targeting the best Chinese students in order to send them to universities in the United States. There were 14 Protestant or Christian universities in China. You have the list here. They have been studied also about for, for the architecture, especially the architecture of the famous architect Henry Killiam Murphy, who was sent to China and worked for the Harvard Yenching uh, Institute. And uh, these um, universities, they were part of the Protestant mission that was targeting the elites of the Republic. That was a very different strategy than the Catholic one that was more working in countryside and was more working in rural areas doing basic work in orphanages, in elderly homes, in uh, parish churches, and in basic schools than developing high education. It is obvious when you compare the 14 Protestant universities, and at the same time, there were only two Catholic universities in China, both founded by French Jesuits. The first Catholic university founded in China by French Jesuits, but also the Chinese Jesuits, Marcien Bo, was in Shanghai, called University L'Aurore, Zhendan Tashui, founded in 1903, within the French concession, and developing important programs, including a faculty of humanities, a faculty of engineering science, and a faculty of medical sciences. This became the largest Catholic university in China with brilliant scholars, but mostly populated by French Jesuit scholars in many different fields, in the three faculties, and also with a French Jesuit as a rector. The buildings of that university were divided in a double campus cut in two parts by the Avenue du Bail, one of the main axes of the French concession. The East Campus included buildings in French style, so kind of parallel buildings close to each other and multi-storied. While the West Campus developed later 
would include modern architecture as the two examples you see on uh, the slides of the uh, building left under is the, was the library and also laboratories and classrooms, while the building to the right was uh, what the Jesuits called the museum. It was a place of natural sciences, the Hude Museum, uh, which was a, a brilliant place and collection of um, natural sciences. The church that was a central building also of the campus uh, was a reinforced concrete modern church designed by French architects and built in 1933. Not a Gothic style, but definitely Western with references to Romanesque architecture. The second Catholic university uh, was the Catholic university called l'Institut des Hautes Études Commerciales et Industrielles, included two faculties of commerce and industry. Today, we would say a kind of business school. And this was founded in Tianjin, so in the north of China, around the central building that you see on the picture on top, in very French style, uh, with a mansard de roof, and that central building included, in its right wing, included a chapel in classic style. Other buildings of the campus were modern, as the museum, there was also a museum on this campus, uh, the Huang He Bai He Museum, uh, where the famous Father Lisson, but also Théard de Chardin, uh, worked for a certain time. These were the two Catholic universities existing uh, until the, the mid 1920s uh, in China, run by French. And this is important because the situation of the French missionaries in China changed dramatically in 1922 when the French Republic lost its patronage on the Catholic mission in China. So from the second half of the 19th century, until the early 1920s, it was the French Republic that was coordinating or that was protecting and controlling, certain would say manipulating, the Catholic missions, not only the French missionaries, but all Catholic missionaries, including Italian, Belgian, etc., in China, by the uh, through the uh, legation and the role of the French uh, ambassador in Beijing. After 1922, Rome succeeded to stop this protectorate and to start an official relationship between the Vatican or the Holy See and China, sending to China Celso Costantini as an apostolic delegate. So Celso Costantini, and this has not yet been said until now, but there's a very crucial point to understand what will follow, was an Italian and definitely was not welcomed by French missionaries in China. He was considered as a rival by most French missionaries, certainly the missionaries in Shanghai, who will continue to be French above, above all, to a, certain, to a certain extent, and also would opposite the policy of inculturation, I mean the architectural inculturation of Monsignor Costantini, will oppose it by continuing to build in French styles, but also in Gothic, but not exclusively in Gothic style. So that shift of 1922 will uh, include several steps. We will briefly see them. And one of these main steps will be the creation of a third Catholic university in Beijing in 1925 that would definitely not be run neither by Jesuits nor by French missionaries, but by American Benedictines and open to a Chinese staff and also developing to culture and art and humanities as being the core of that university program. The architecture would be in accordance with that program of inculturation. So I will not 
explain what enculturation is. Uh, you have read the different texts uh, sent by Professor Clark. Uh, before it, I'm, well, I'm quoting um, Professor Standard here, but I've seen he's in the attendance, so I'm um, very, <laughs> I'm very happy to, to welcome him here and uh, to, in fact, uh, insist on that uh, definition he gives of the enculturation, not in just the general way, which is the process whereby those belonging to a particular culture express from within that culture what they have received from another culture, but he placed that in the perspective of uh, the Catholic and universal perspective of the Catholic Church, which is a dynamic movement of receiving and giving. So it is not only the inculturation of receiving from a culture and uh, including it in its own culture, but it's also enriching the universal culture with the result of this uh, inculturation. So it is a movement that is a dynamic and never ending movement. Celso Costantini arrives in China in 1922. It's the end of the French protectorate and he comes with his reference document, which is the encyclic apostolical letter Maximum Elud from 1919. And uh, this will legitimate his work and he will in these 1920s try to update the position of the Catholic Church in China that was far behind the Protestants at that time, not only architecturally, because of this conservatism of the Catholic missions controlled by the French. So he had a very precise agenda, but he was also in a hurry because he had indeed to, uh, uh, well, deal with that time problem, with that delay, as we have seen 14 universities and 12 universities, but that is only one aspect. So in 1924, he organized in Shanghai, the first plenary council that is the first time in the history of the Catholic Church in China that all the missionary bishops came together and talked with each other about the issues of the Catholic mission to China. Before, they were just depending on the propaganda fide in Rome, and they had individual relationships with the propaganda fide in that uh, hierarchy, the pyramidal hierarchy of the Catholic Church. And then, of course, they knew the bishops of the neighbor, neighboring apostolic vicariates, but they never met each other all together. This picture taken in Shanghai 1924 is amazing. In the middle, you have Costantini and all the other bishops on this picture, they are all Westerners. The only Chinese on the pictures, well, they are, uh, they are not bishops. And this is a situation that uh, Monsignor Costantini want to change. And in 1926, 28 October, is a very important date because that's the date of the consecration of the six first Chinese bishops by Pope Pius XI in Rome. That is really a milestone, that is a turning point. And in the following years, more bishops, more Chinese bishops would be consecrated. They would not receive very prominent dioceses in the beginning, but this is a movement that uh, was starting. Monsignor Costantini also tried to promote a better education for Chinese priests who would, by developing new regional seminaries, a university and seminaries needed buildings. At the same time, in that a uh, new policy of the mission worldwide, so not only in China, Rome promoted through the missionary exhibition of 1925, uh, ethnographic interest for local cultures 
and identified art and architecture as a major tool for evangelization in Africa, in Asia, everywhere in the world. So it's not only a Chinese story, but this should be placed in a much larger perspective, including Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Indochina, and other countries. The aim was of convincing Western Christians of the equal value of all cultures. This is an absolute revolution. And you could imagine that for many uh, missionaries, including in China, this was unacceptable. And certainly the generation of these conservative missionaries who were, had been fed with the ideas of the Mission Civilisatrice, this was definitely a revolution and a revolution that would be promoted by a younger generation of missionaries who were influenced, amongst others, by the ideas of uh, Vincent, Vincent Leb and Antoine uh, Cotta. In 1927, Rome opened a missionary ethnologic museum in a Lateran, so that is a permanent collection of art from all civilizations worldwide. And in 1931, at the colonial exhibition in Paris, the pavilion of the Catholic missions, which you see on the cover of this magazine, produced by Belgian uh, uh, Benedictines, l'artisan liturgique. Well, the pavilion of the Catholic mission was a syncretic building with Asian and North African elements. Uh, so the tower is a typical Moroccan minaret, but you can see that the main gate of the church is referring to a, a Chinese uh, pylon. That is for the context, Rome and universities in China. Second point, the hopes and the failure of American Benedictine university projects. Why did the Holy See entrusted the project to American Benedictines? I tried to summarize this in um, uh, a graph with the Holy See and uh, its representative in Beijing, uh, Monsignor Costantini in yellow, and how these uh, Roman hierarchy try to involve American Benedictines in the project of creating, in green, in the project of creating the um, university, the Furen University in Beijing uh, that we can see in blue. Why American Benedictines? Well, because after the First World War, Rome tried to involve more missionary societies than only the French and the traditional European ones, Franciscans from Italy, for example, or Belgian skirt fathers, but try to involve new blood, younger missionary congregations, as for example, the Marinol fathers from the United States, uh, but also the Benedictines to join the mission field uh, in China. Um, the Benedictines are um, in the United States, one of the congregations, the American Cassiniense congregation, includes 14 abbeys, 14 monasteries, headed by the Arch Abbey of St. Vincent Latrobe in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. It is uh, the abbey of the abbot of that abbey who was convinced to uh, invest or to go to China and to start this university. But most of the other abbeys of his congregation were not enthusiastic at all. They didn't understand why they should have to go to China, but they could not refuse the invitation from the Holy See. This is how. Costantini was uh, the, the representative of the propaganda fide in China. He interacted with the Benedictines from the United States. Don Aurelius Steele, the abbot, became the chancellor of the Furen University. And a small community of American Benedictines 
was sent to Beijing to start the uh, university. This explains also why Adelbert Gresnik have been chosen to be sent to Beijing, because at that time he was working in the Benedictine Abbey of uh, the Bronx in New York. He was known by American Benedictines, and American Benedictines would accept him as one of theirs to be sent and to uh, design these buildings and build them with the money they would fundraise. The history of the Chinese, of the Fujian Tashi uh, has been uh, studied. There are several good publications uh, in Chinese, but also uh, in English. I'm referring here to the book of uh, Matteo Nicolini Zani on uh, Christian monks in China. There is a chapter on Benedictines, and a part of that chapter is on uh, the uh, Furen Tashi. Uh, but most of these publications, or all of these publications, are not looking to the architecture. A site was chosen in the heart of Beijing. Let's look at this site. It's a winter one. You see the lakes are frozen. That gives this white color. Uh, Furen Tashi is the uh, yellow square. It's uh, north of Beihai. It's not far away from Beitang, the purple cross. And it's very close also to Beida, the red square to the right, and to the National Library, which is the other red square close to uh, Beihai. So this is really in the historic city where the uh, Holy See was able to acquire a big block, in fact, two blocks, uh, near the Prince Gong mansion, which is also a palace of a Qing prince with a garden at the north side. But they bought another one, Tao Bei Le Fu, including also a big residence and two gardens, a flower garden and a vegetable garden. The uh, first buildings, I don't know if you can see my arrow, uh, the first, uh, the existing buildings of the residence of the palace were used by the Benedictine community to start the uh, university. And so they looked like a flower garden with a very long gallery said to be the longest, longest gallery uh, in uh, Beijing. The longest one, uh, by the way, um, is in the, the Summer Palace. And uh, other uh, typical architecture of the, uh, of the palace architecture, one being turned into a chapel for the monastic community. And this community you see here on these two pictures uh, was very small, were Benedictines. And they were, their aim was to function as a disinterested administrators of an educational institution dedicated wholly and exclusively to the Catholic mission in China. So they were not like Jesuits, you know, holding the most chair of the university. So instead of reserving for their own the prerogative of teaching, they would associate themselves in this office. European confreres, members of secular clergy, as well as prominent Chinese literati, literati and lay scholars would be the staff of uh, this university. The start was very fast and very successful. They opened as a small academy in 1925, uh, welcoming 23 students. And in 1931, there were more than 1,000 students, one fifth of them being Catholic. In 1927, the university was accredited by the Chinese government. That was a very important moment in its history. That is the moment of the picture you see uh, on uh, the bottom, where Cesco Constantini is in the middle and uh, Gresnik to the left in this group. And in 1929, there were th three faculties of arts, sciences, and education, including 13 
departments. No law, no uh, medicine. But the years 1929, 1930, 1931 would be a dramatic turn, a combination of elements coming from the then historical context. In 1929, in July 29, the Archabbot still was in the Vatican. And there he had discussed with the Propaganda Fide the financing for the construction of a new building that was needed because of the increasing population of students. And he sent radiograms. First, he approved the erection of a new university building designed by Father Gresnicht. And in the second one, he appoints Gresnicht as the director of the building operations. And four days later, he sent a new, very enthusiastic cable authorizing the start of the full building program because there was a phase A and a phase B, but he got all the money, he got them from banks and approving a big budget of 250,000 gold dollars. And immediately the work started. But on 25 October, 1929 was the date of the great crash, the Black Friday, of Wall Street that would impact it dramatically uh, the mission to China and especially the project of the Benedictines. Cesso Costantini lays the cornerstone and then a second dramatic event occurred is the death of Father Steele in a car crash on February 1930. The combination of the economic crisis and the death of the Archabbot, who was really the central person in the United States of the University of Beijing project, would completely turn the mind of the American Benedictines, who will very fast completely abandon all their commitments with the Vatican. The 14 abbeys stopped to fundraise for China, explaining that their finances and their fundraising should first go to the American population victim of the great crisis. It would not understand why to finance this university in China. So in 1930, the uh, building was finished and the university could use the buildings, but there was a very serious financial pro uh, problem that would result in 1933 with the withdrawal of the Benedictines and their replacement by German missionaries, notabene we are in 1933, uh, German missionaries from the Society of the Divine Word. So look at this graph. The Benedictines in green are gone, including uh, Gresnicht, and other person were changed. The head of the propaganda fide, Cardinal van Rossem, passed away in 32 and was replaced by uh, Cardinal Fumazoni Biondi. In, uh, but also in China, uh, Celso Costantini returned to Europe in 1932. He was sick and was replaced by Marion Zanin, another Italian delegate. So the actors changed completely and the university that was now built received a new stuff that was a German stuff. Very short and dramatic history. And it's in that context that that main building was designed and constructed by Edelbert Gresnicht. And the two main questions I will raise now are first, how did Father Gresnik design a modern Chinese looking university building? He had no experience at all in architecture and he knew nothing about China and Chinese architecture. And what makes this university different from the Protestant ones? So what was the program? 
the new building would be the new face of Fujian. It would include auditoriums, classroom, laboratoriums, offices, dorms for 400 students, no chapel, but would have to integrate in the gardens. So look at the, the, the aerial on the right. The yellow uh, frame is the uh, old mansion, the old palace of Tai Le Bei Le Fu. In green is the uh, Hua Yuan, the uh, flower garden, with in red the long gallery, in uh, the, the red dots are the pavilions and the other old buildings that should be respected. And the blue area was the area of the Tsai Yuan, so the vegetable garden where the new building would be built. The orange frame was the sport fields at the other side of the street. This is in the heart of Beijing, very big plots. The new university program should, be, should also receive other morphology, would not be a campus as the campus is designed by Henry Murphy and all the American architects for the American Protestant missions. So the reference to Chinese architecture should exist, but should not refer to Chinese palace and residence architecture. Because first, there was already a residence, the Tao Bai Le Fu, but the most important was that the Protestant universities, they were referring to that palace architecture. As we can see on these three pictures, uh, the campus of Beida or Yenching, Ashe, uh, with these open courtyards, buildings that were not connected with each other, they were independent from each other. And so defining courtyards with open corners. And this is what was uh, not wanted by the Catholics, who said that palace architecture is expensive and not practical. The circulations are not practical at all because you have to go out and then enter uh, to the, the next building. In Beijing, the weather is very cold in the winter. So this is not practical, not practical for heating, not practical for circulations and also referring too explicitly to the architecture of the Protestants. Gresnicht would design a building referring to three different, uh, a combination of three different uh, quotes. The first one is monastic architecture. He was a monk. He had lived all his life in Benedictine abbeys that all have a cloister, which is a courtyard, but a closed courtyard, not with open corners, and a courtyard dominated by a church on one of its sides. This is a very long tradition going back to the Middle Ages, going back to the medieval Benedictine architecture that revived in the 19th century. You see here this drawing of a, a Pugin, and that also was the abbey, the style of the Abbey of Maretsu, where Father Gresnicht was a profess and uh, had uh, what belonging to that um, community. So this is a background number one. And this morphology of monasteries is not limited to Gothic architecture, but you also could have it in classic architecture, like this Benedictine Abbey of Weingarten in Germany from the 18th century, that developed in a very classical composition with a church in the middle and cloisters at both sides, surrounded by wings and with pavilions of kind of towers in the four corners. I uh, use the opportunity of this talk just to mention or to make a little advertisement for a very comprehensive book on monastic architecture entitled Life Inside the Cloister. If some of you are interested, they could understand much more about this monastic architecture than what I say here. The second influence of Father Gresnicht is the French rational modular 
design method developed by Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand in his famous book of um, design method of the courses that he was teaching at the Polytechnical School, the Imperial Polytechnical School created by Napoleon in Paris, published in 1802, 1803. This is a design method which is based on modules, on elements, on combination of elements and on modules. And this generated a standardized architecture that would perfectly fit with the French rational way of composing space of organizing society and under the empire and the neoclassical generation first half of the 19th century hundreds of buildings were designed according to this method square plans squares that could be divided into rectangles and into squares wings rational circulations of corridors of staircases placed in corners and on different kind of axes. Here, three examples, a great hospice in Brussels on the lower left with one courtyard for men and another one for women, a prison in Brussels above a square divided also in men and women, two different parts, each divided in two, so a square divided in four squares, or to the right, barracks in Milan. So this is also a square divided into rectangles, but in the other direction with the main wing in the middle. And uh, this is just behind the San Ambrogio in Milano. And the two smaller cloisters you see to the right on the aerial pictures are in fact the cloisters of the cathedral that are used today by the Catholic University of Milan, also that relationship cloister and university. And the third element in the composition of Adelbert Gresnicht are the Chinese elements. And this we can see how he uh, tried to understand or grasp the essence of Chinese architecture by visiting buildings in Beijing and surroundings by reading the literature, but at that time it was not very developed. There were some basic works, but essentially visiting the buildings of the North and uh, drawing, sketching as a painter. And some of these sketches are uh, kept. This is one where we see an elevation of a building referring clearly to the Forbidden City. I put that picture on the right of the uh, first courtyard of the Forbidden City. And you see on the top of his sketch, the plan, which is a rectangle with towers at the corner divided in two parts. Never forget that at that time in the 1920s, Beijing was still surrounded with its walls. These are other sketches where Father Adelbert, who arrived in Beijing, not in 1925, as had been said previous today, but in January 1927, and he started to make drawings, to start to enter. And he get frequently the visit of Archbishop Costantini, who came to see his drawings and to try to understand when he would really master this soul of Chinese architecture and receive the green light for designing the university building and the other educational buildings. Father Adelbert would choose the military architecture as a Chinese reference. The city walls, the bell and drum towers, and he had fantastic examples in Beijing. Compare the bell tower and one of the towers of the Fujian Tashui, and there is an obvious quote. Even better, the towers of Fujian Tashui are built with Ming bricks coming from sections of the Ming wall of Beijing that were under demolition at that time. They bought these big Ming bricks and they used them as the foundation of the building, very symbolic, as well as for the whole elevation of the four corner towers. So the reference is absolutely explicit. 
This is our program, a rational plan, just designed like Durand. Look at the corridors that are at the north side to protect the rooms from the north wind. The rooms are opening to the west side, to the south side, sorry, and in the two smaller wings, the corridor is in the middle with dorms at both sides. Classrooms are in the towers. Staircases are near the towers. It is a perfectly rational uh, plan on a very big scale. The courtyard that could be considered as a cloister with a gallery only at the uh, north side of the south wing. Today, there is green and trees in these courtyards that are very large. You see the surface to the left. Originally, they were huge open spaces, very close. Look at the corners. They are not open. The building develops rational connections, rational circulations, corridors. You don't have to go outside to go to one room to another room, to classroom, to dorms. Everything is in the same building where a community is living just like a monastic community around a cloister. This is functional. This is full reinforced concrete and bricks. There is no wood in this building. Uh, the two marble looking liking columns, they are, uh, this is fake marble. This is a recent. Originally, this was reinforced concrete. This is the main hall of the building. If you compare the plan of Fujen and the first project of uh, Yen Qing by Murphy in 1922, the two references are very obvious. Uh, the open courtyards with the open corners in Yen Qing and the closed courtyards with the towers placed in the corners of uh, Fu Ren. But both are embedded in a park, in a Chinese landscape, in a garden, and both are symmetrically designed at both sides of axis. Just Could five minutes. Fujian is monastic, enclosed, rational, Chinese military, and urban. My fourth and last point is about the construction of a rational modern building with a Chinese roof. How would Father? Edelbert designed a modern building with a reinforced concrete structure. Well, he did not, because he didn't know anything about it. He was not an architect. And he worked together with architects and construction firms who calculated the concrete, who designed the modules, and who also coordinated the construction of these works in 15 months. This very short time span was possible because of the rational and modular construction. The plans, these are not designed by Gresnicht, definitely not. Uh, the, the, the plans show these uh, modular structure. In the main central wing, the library with the blue frame was on the basement, while the auditorium was above it. There was no auditorium as a separate building like in most other universities in China. Here it was included as a main building within the grid of the Durand plan. The sections show the rational modern construction. It is completely modern because it is reinforced concrete, combining different types of roofs. The Chinese roof for the West for the south face, steel roofs on the auditorium, reinforced concrete structures, sewage system, beams for the other parts of the building. The construction firm who finalized the plans and who, does, and who um, run the construction was a French construction firm, Brossard et Maupin, who were present in East Asia from Harbin and Sunyang to uh, Hanoi and uh, Phnom Penh and Singapore, including in several Chinese cities. And they worked together with 
with uh, Father Edelbert for Furen University, but also his buildings in Kaifeng and Xuanhua. The section you see is a section of Xuanhua, where the roofs are uh, reinforced concrete roofs. In Furen, they are wooden roofs. What did Father Edelbert? Well, Father Edelbert's works was just limited to make the face of this rational building Chinese looking. Again, he is an artist and he would play with elements from the repertoire, just like the elements of Durand, but here in Chinese style, he will use them in his construction. The brackets, the plaster frieze, the Ming bricks, the white marble carvings, the green roof tiles, but all this decoration is concentrated on the face of the building and that face is the south facade. The other facades are just functional and rational. There is a picturesque dialogue between the new building and the pavilions and the gallery and the garden, which is a very strong, we could also see it as a kind of gender, a yin-yang relation between the strong masculine military architecture, especially the backside, and the wooden light structures in the garden, this very strong contrast. That contrast is telling exactly what the Catholic University wanted to uh, give as a message. This building also inserted in the skyline of Beijing. Look at the relationship of the towers of Furen and Bell and Drum Tower on the skyline. My picture is taken of in a foggy day, but we can see it. And for the rest, the other walls of the, the, the three wings, the three secondary wings had no Chinese roof, but had crenellation, just like the Great Wall and other city walls, referring to that military architecture. Let's conclude Chinese Renaissance or modern chinoiserie? Well, the architecture of uh, the Furen Tashui, as soon it was completed, was immediately propagandized by the Catholic Church worldwide. You see here some example from Boston to Rome. Uh, I found uh, lists of journalists who were invited to visit the building and to write positive articles. But the most amazing is that Henry Murphy visited Furen on 19 May 1931 together with Father Edelbert. So they met each other. I don't know what they were talking about because one was architect and the other one was an artist, but they certainly visited the building together and perhaps Henry Murphy was horrified by that building. I don't know, unfortunately, we have no transcript of their visit, but that link existed and that is a, a, a beautiful element. So is this a, chi a chinoiserie from the 1920s? A main question, and this is not the last word about it during the three days of this symposium. What is important to understand and what is clear from the story of Furen is that this is a foreign decision and a foreign centralized decision. This Sino-Christian decision is, fits in the pyramid of the Catholic hierarchy where Cesso Costantini is the key person. It is not a Chinese decision at all. And it has been mediatized in the West as if it had been done also for Western Catholics uh, communities who didn't know anything about China. This is an encounter of a top-down cynicization in a Chinese elite context, which is an elite context of a, of a university with literati and academics. This is something very, very exceptional, not comparable with any parish community uh, at that time, of course. And Grisnicht, in his article you have read, uh, is referring to Jacques Maritain in a typical uh, um, uh, discourse from, that, uh, from the Catholic Church at that time. 
Catholicity, says Maritain, is a sublime and inexhaustible principle of fecundity, which without injury to the individuality of any national culture imparts to such the power of perennial self-renewal, beneficently conserving whatever is good, beautiful and true, and purging away only the dross that comes of human imperfection. That is an absolutely idealized vision of the role of the Catholic universal church, as on these drawings, all the styles are welcome and contribute to that universality that respects all the cultures. And you understand so different this is in comparison with the mission civilisatrice of the French uh, missions before 1922. This combat, this fight between uh, French conservative missionaries and this new movement of a new generation crystallized in the 1920s. And the Furenta was the archetype launching at the highest level with the legitimation of Rome, this new tendency. I'm finished with two pictures without any comment that are showing you how this modern chinoiserie is working. You have seen the modern building, the reinforced concrete structure, the logic circulation and the functionality of this building that is considerably modern and very new in China at that time, except the facade that is decorated by a painter who understand more or less Chaputuo, the Chinese architecture, just after having visited the temples in Beijing and around. Look at this wooden element on the front at the left, uh, that is a kind of bracket in a corner that is just a postiche element in wood that is sticked on a corner. Uh, all the elements are also just decorations, just like a postiche on a facade. But when you are looking at the other sides, well, with these rational flat roofs, these crenellations are also just for the gallery. They are there to referring to the military architecture, to our citadel, as Gresnik is mentioning his building in one letter that he is sending to a friend, he's quoting to our citadel with the towers, the crenellation, etc. But the most important, let's never forget it, were the students. And the students worked in a modern environment. This is the dorm, a room for four students, a modernization by science, and a cynicization by culture. I thank you for your interest. Thank you, Professor Kumans. Thank you. And as you, um, oh, you did actually un unshared your screen. Thank you so much. That that no one can, I think, no one can compare to the lavish and wonderful use of images that you in incorporate into that. Well, now we have a response by Professor uh, Eugenio Menegon, who will be uh, offering a response to Professor Kuman's uh, discussion. Professor Menegon. You need to unmute. Okay, so yes, I unmuted. I actually was taking furiously notes uh, uh, during uh, the talk. Um, I have uh, a little presentation where I jotted some comments because I didn't have uh, a formal paper to see beforehand. So I will just share some more reflections on the fly. Um, can you see my presentation right now? Yes. Okay, so very good. So uh, this is the scheme of the paper that uh, Professor um, Commons presented to us, sorry, with uh, a whole series of uh, important questions that he presented to us. His uh, presentation was wonderfully clear, uh, very much uh, based on uh, uh, several steps that were steeped in historical um, 
kind of details of all types. Um, he explained to us uh, the historical background, both of the mission in general at the time, how uh, the Fle French clergy and a certain way of conservative Catholicism was dominating at the time. And the paper that was given before by Professor Clark gave also a wonderful background on that. Um, then he explained why the American Benedictine were brought in, uh, the fact that uh, Van Rossum in Rome, the prefect of Propaganda Fide, and his envoy Constantini, the first uh, uh, nuncius sent to China, uh, who established uh, eventually full diplomatic relations with the Republic of China, who called the first synod, was really the representative of a new wave of um, seeing uh, the mission in China. Behind this uh, was a group of Chinese and uh, of Western uh, intellectuals, uh, we could call them based in China. Uh, we had Ma Xianbo, we had In Liandre, we had Vincent Lebe, and uh, we had Kota uh, that were mentioned by Professor um, um, uh, Coleman's. And in particular, I would like to point to the Chinese roots of this movement uh, and to the fact that Furang University started as the idea of Yin Liandre. Now, Yin Liandre was a Manchu, uh, a native of Beijing, who had turned into a journalist at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, very much under the wings of uh, the French church and uh, the French uh, political power at the time. Um, he was based in uh, between Tianjin and Beijing. And he is the one who, together with Ma Xianbo, wrote letters to the Pope and really even before Lebe and Cotta, but at the same time, more or less, but just a little bit before, started this movement of um, anti-colonial um, resistance within the Catholic Church in China. Um, and that movement, of course, uh, had a longer history among the Protestants. Uh, uh, there was much more of a culture of uh, native pastors uh, and uh, passing on the baton to a new generation of uh, local leaders. Uh, this took longer in the Chinese church. Um, the first bishop, as we have seen, are from 1926. Uh, but really, the origins go back to this circles of intellectuals who were talking to each other uh, based between Shanghai and northern China. Um, and Yin Lianzhi really could be said to be the true founder of the idea of Furen University. Even the name itself uh, to an extent uh, was uh, uh, connected to uh, previous history of an academy that he had established. Uh, I want to go first to the final question, uh, the final slide of uh, Professor uh, Coleman's. Uh, Chinese Renaissance or mo modern chinoiserie? What are these uh, um, constructions uh, by uh, on, on the Furen University campus. And I will talk about a few ideas based on uh, some uh, writings that Professor Comens uh, shared with me, in particular, um, an essay that was written at the time in 1929 on the inauguration of the works on the campus by Costantini, where Costantini gave a few general ideas of what uh, um, this idea of a Chinese architecture and this fusion of West uh, and East would be, um, but also some of the um, writings of uh, um, uh, uh, Gresnik himself uh, on architecture. And maybe if you, Professor Comas, can tell us a little bit more, you, will, you just mentioned this very quickly in your introductory uh, lecture, saying he was not a writer, it was not someone who would theorize very much. So we'll be interested in learning more uh, what is your theory behind the publication of these essays uh, that are signed by Gresnik. Um, um, some of the ideas that actually we find in the writings of uh, um, Costantini uh, and also or, of Gresnik is the idea of uh, a universalism of uh, uh, the Catholic faith, and uh, that uh, the Catholic faith uh, can go in any culture and find a home there because uh, 
it doesn't have really one place that it defi defines it culturally. Uh, and it can actually uh, absorb the indigenous, and this is more the word that is being used in the 1920s and 30s, uh, the word enculturation that was used by Professor Comans is more of a, a recent uh, uh, theological and also um, maybe artistic uh, uh, conception that uh, we are using today. Uh, so these are two ideas that I wanted to talk a little bit about. The other is the idea of visibility versus invisibility. Uh, the fact that this architecture, uh, and this connects also with the paper of Professor Clark, uh, is done to be visible, to be actually quite imposing, but at the same time has certain features, certain Chinese features that are trying to make it invisible in the sense of making it uh, part of the landscape. And so that uh, uh, photograph that Professor Comens took from the towers of uh, uh, the Fuden campus today, where there is this sort of parallelism with the towers uh, of the city of Beijing, is really a way to say, this is part of the city. It belongs. It is visible and yet at the same time invisible. Um, I'm also interested in learning more about uh, um, the relationship of Murphy and Gresnik, uh, not so much uh, their exchanges as we have heard from Professor Comans. Uh, uh, it is not possible to know what they told each other, what they thought about each other, but really uh, more about uh, the politics, the competition between Protestants versus Catholics. So Professor Comans, you mentioned the fact that the Protestants were inspired by the open architecture of the palace, whereas uh, uh, in the Catholic project of uh, Gresnik, we have a more monastic and closed architecture, and also we have references to the military uh, infrastructure of Beijing. So how does that translate also in a sort of competition in the architectural field of what was actually a competition in the educational field and in the religious field in general, which was becoming less uh, of uh, um, sort of closure to the heretical and much more uh, competition in, the, in a modern field of education, but what's still a competition. You talked about uh, also um, of the construction of Furen and even the entire idea of this Sino-Christian hybrid art and architecture as a foreign decision, um, as something that uh, really came from the top down. Um, cor um, Costantini talks a lot about the nation and Chinese nationalism as well. So it's kind of interesting that yes, there is this foreign decision, there is this coming from outside, but there is also the continuous reference to Sun Yat-sen and his thinking to the Republic of China, to the fact that this new art architecture and institution like Furen will be in fact respectful of authority will be part of the construction of the new nation. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. So these are some of the general points. Going back then to your question, Chinese Renaissance of modern chinoiserie. If we consider all these points that I have made, these attempts on the part of Costantini, for example, to refer to the history of the Benedictines back in, uh, in Europe, uh, as uh, the ones who saved uh, the ancient culture of the Roman and Greek uh, uh, civilization uh, and transmitted it on. And the fact that now this is institution, this new Furen University can do that, be uh, both uh, uh, symbolically bringing along the tradition of the Benedictines, but also continuing the transmission of Chinese um, um, traditional culture and then we compare this with some comments by Grisnik in an essay in 1931 that you, Professor Comments, uh, have actually used in another of your recent publications. We see almost a, a difference in style between Costantini, who is very diplomatic and very careful not to present himself as a foreign uh, envoy, but someone who really collaborates with uh, the Chinese state, uh, who tries to be part of this new project of building the nation. And Grisnik, on the other hand, who is much more, I would say, in a, a Western a way of seeing things, and even in a confrontational um, 
relationship with Confucianism. Uh, he certainly says that uh, there is a, a, a need of a more radical kind of change in China today than ever in the past, although we shouldn't discard what is good in ancient culture. Uh, then he goes on to say that uh, at the same time, there shouldn't be as an eclectic combination of all the new. And he goes on to talk about ideology behind this. And he really pits Confucianism against Christianity. Confucianism can no longer be expected to supply this sort of uh, um, ideological base for, chi for China. It cannot survive in a sophisticated age, the questions all, uh, and how can a culture be born again when it is old? And so he says, Christianity is what can do that. Christianity accomplished the miracle of the rejuvenation of the Greco-Roman civilization. This is an echo of what also to an extent, but in a much more diplomatic way, Constantini was saying, and the Christianity transcends all civilizations. Um, it is alien to none. Indeed, the terms alien and indigenous are applicable only to the particularized religions of races and nations. They are inapplicable to a universal religion. So it's kind of interesting that actually Gresnik is even rejecting the idea of indigenous in favor of the idea of the universal. Uh, and uh, I have a series of images here and I see that I am a little bit over time, so I will finish very off, very quickly with uh, uh, this idea of invisibility, visibility and centrality of uh, the previous generation of churches in Beijing that are the presence of Catholic architecture in Beijing. Here we see the Nantang as it was in the early 19th century, which is in dialogue almost with the, the Xuan Woman, this large gate that doesn't exist anymore. And it, you, as you can see, there is a bylaw in Chinese style in front. There is this sort of um, hybrid style that was popular in the 18th century in the Qianlong reign of a gate uh, in the sort of uh, uh, Occidental style. And then there is the Baroque facade of the church itself. So you, we, you see elements that are being combined already here. You see the verticality, but then you see also the centrality of these churches uh, in the landscape of Beijing, a centrality that was particularly important uh, in the West uh, when maps were being produced uh, for patrons, for kings uh, and the church, showing how close the churches were to imperial power, how central they were in the city. Now, this might have not been always the case in reality in terms of connection with the Catholic community. For example, the Peitang was uh, which is very close to where uh, Furen University was later built, uh, was extremely close to the palace, so much so that, uh, as you mentioned, Professor Comans, it raised eyebrows. But in terms of connections with the Catholic community, it was a very inconvenient place. Uh, it was invisible, actually, all surrounded by walls. You needed to go through a gate uh, with a porter with permission to go for uh, uh, the kind of celebration that we have seen in that painting from the Louvre that Professor Clark showed us. And so there is, uh, on the one hand, a very high visibility in maps and for European uh, who see these maps of Beijing and they think we are close to the power uh, to the imperial palace, but really an invisibility within the city itself in terms of their size, in terms of how high they are in the landscape, although they are higher of the city landscape. Uh, that is not the case, it seems to me, with uh, what you have talked about today. Um, this edifices are large, they are visible, they are in um, conversation with the, the rest of the city. So going back to my questions here, if you can then comment on some of these ideas that I just threw out there and whether this modern chinoiserie uh, uh, is something that you conclude is really the soul of, uh, uh, and here I want to move actually to some, some images uh, of, uh, modern occidentary, you can call it, in China today. How do you judge then what is happening today in China in terms of the constructions of these buildings? These are all buildings in China built in the last 20 years. And uh, are they the opposite uh, mirror of what you're talking about when you're looking at the architecture 
uh, both of, uh, let's say, Harvard Yanjing, uh, or the, sorry, of the Yanjing campus or the Furen campus, or are they something different? Um, do they represent uh, something else than that? And I will conclude here. Thank you. Professor Menegon, thank you so much. So we, uh, we, we ha actually have orchestrated it so that there is just a little bit of extra time after Professor Stephanie Wong's uh, presentation and hopefully response and questions for or maybe to open up a little bit. I'd like to, we need to stop at about, in about three minutes. So I'm going to let Professor Kumans respond and before we take our, our brief break. Professor Kumans. Uh, thank you, Professor Manigon, for your uh, very inspiring reflections. And I'm sorry not having sent you a text before because I had no text. You know, I'm finishing an ERC program application now. I'm really uh, in a terrible time. But anyway, um, I would like first to maybe focus on the character of Gresnicht. Gresnicht is a monk. He has no personal ambitions. He is a humble and a modest person. He's obedient. This is why Costantini chose him, because he knew that he would do what he wanted. He would not be an architect who has his own ideas and who would clash with Constantini. Constantini had no time for that. He was running behind, as we have seen. That is why that virtual meeting or imagining what Murphy and Gresnik could have uh, told each other. Well, Gresnik, uh, Murphy is an architect, very ambitious guy with designing several university projects into China, uh, very renowned, writing articles in journals too and being a reference for other architects and doing business, this guy was paid. Costa Gresnik never was paid a penny. St. Vincent Abbey should have paid Maretsu Abbey, but at the end of the bankruptcy, they never paid a penny to Maretsu. So in fact, Maretsu paid, uh, paid Gresnik for his stay in China. There are amazing letters between these abbeys about money about paying the daily fee of a monk. Huh? This is another aspect of the reality of a mission field and, and so. So Murphy is an architect, but at the same time in the 1920s in China, you have that first generation of Chinese architects who are educated in the United States or in France. Uh, Yang Sichuan is of course the most famous one. And these guys come back to China with a uh, Western education with a lot of ambitions and try to get commissions from the Guomintang, from the new nation that is under construction and that is developing the new capital, Nanjing. It's not Peiping, huh? it's no more the capital at that time. So that is the architectural landscape. And I think in this room here, some people know that much better than I. Oh, I've seen that Lydalin is here. Hi. Uh, so this is a completely different aspect. And that is also why Costantini could not find a Chinese architect with a Western degree, a guy who had learned uh, Beaux-Arts and uh, the, the, the French design in the American universities. Nancy Steinhardt also contributed to publish a book about that. So uh, this is the other aspect of the issue that makes that Gresnicht is a kind of UFO. He is not an architect. He has no arch networks with any architect. He has no firms. He has no finances and ambitions. And he is obviously uncomfortable with all what's happening with his fame, because when Fujian is finished, suddenly he's on the front page of journals and journalists come and interview him. And he's really going under the table. He, he is absolutely unhappy with that. I think that is, that is an important point to understand a character who, as I said, turned back to Boiron painting and sculpture as soon left China. Huh? He's not an architect. So I don't know what he really designed of Fujian, but I think all his drawings are elevations and decoration. 
but he did not make any plan. He was not able, you know, to see the, the surface of rooms, to see what are the standards and all these things. He knew nothing about that. So uh, I think that is answering uh, two of your questions. And also not forget, Gresnicht is not a missionary. He has not been educated as a missionary. He's an artist going to building works where he is just with his with himself on scaffoldings. Uh, and and he, he has not been educated as the Murlos, who was trained during three years as a missionary and then sent like a commando, you know, like a mission field. He definitely not. So he knew nothing about the theories of inculturation of China, of different generation of missionaries. He was completely out of that. He was in a studio on his own, surrounded by other Benedictines who were living in silence in their cloister garden. That is how I see him. And these articles are also to be placed in that context where definitely Costantini needed that icon of a Benedictine monk creating a myth of a monk architect against the will of the architect in question, and that completely romantic propaganda vision of referring to the Benedictines who had saved the Christian culture in the, in the early Middle Ages, in the dark ages of the early Middle Ages, and transponing that ideas of Christianity, reviving a collapsing civilization, transponing that to China in the 20th century. This is, of course, completely propaganda and completely romantic Western vision. And that is why this supports my idea of a chinoiserie. And let me then give me the clue of this point. That is communism. Never forget communism in this story. Because in the story of Costantini, taken over by Gresnik, uncritically, completely uncritically, Costantini, that idea of Western strong ideologies revive that collapsing empire of that decadent China. But I found a text where he also says, but all the Western theories are not good. And we see people in China now suddenly be interested in other theories. He's never mentioning the word communism that is out of his vocabulary, of course, but he's clearly refer referring to that. So, and that explain also why they are running behind time, not our conference, but they were running behind time, competing with Protestants, competing with developing communism, trying to target the elite of the Kuomintang where the Protestants were much better than the Catholics to enter in the government and even uh, in the bedroom of, of Tiang. Uh, so this was, they, they were much better than the Catholics. And that was the challenge where this university would become really the face of it. And the whole collapsed in 1931, 1932. Professor Kumans, that's an excellent time because actually we are slightly behind time. And uh, I, you know, the, the sign of a successful symposium, a scholarly symposium is that we have far more to talk about than we have time. So I'll count that as a glorious success. Uh, Professor Menegon mentioned this, this dichotomy of visible and invisible. I think we should all become invisible for five minutes and, uh, and then we will reconvene. Professor Stephanie Wong will speak. So let's just give everyone five minutes of a, of a break. And we, I, we orchestrated this so there should be a, some extra time after the Q&A section of Professor Wong. But again, thank you so much. We'll reconvene in five minutes for, for Professor Wong's discussion. So thank you, everyone.